Good evening and welcome to the seminar of the uh, History and Games Lab. Um, I'm very pleased that uh, uh, our speaker tonight is uh, John uh, Buckley, who is Professor of Military History at the Depa Department of History, Politics and War Studies of Wolverhampton uh, University. Um, Professor Buckley has uh, uh, written extensively, especially uh, on the Second World War, and uh, is the author of uh, uh, the first, uh, um, like we can describe it, the, the first uh, uh, game book, history game book, uh, published by uh, Penguin, uh, which was published, uh, um, I think, uh, just before Christmas, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. autumn, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I got it for Christmas myself, and uh, yeah. <laughs> I uh, and and I um, it was a Christmas present. I bought it as well as a Christmas present, and uh, I first came across the book in 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 in, uh, in the bookshop here um, where I live, uh, and uh, I, I was particularly interested by the fact that Penguin uh, uh, I decided to publish a. a an interactive uh, history book. Um, mm. I believe it is the first of its kind published by um, uh, by yeah, Penguin. I, I, yeah, I, I don't know of any other. And um, uh, so, yes, it's been um, a, a, a voyage of discovery, should we say, in terms of how to make it work. So um, talking about that is um, kind of what I'm interested in, really, as well. And that is uh, what we will uh, discuss uh, tonight, the genesis of uh, the Armchair General. Um, can you defeat the Nazis, which is the title of, uh, uh, of the uh, game book published by uh, Penguin, uh, written by Professor Buckley. Um, but without further ado, I now hand you over to our uh, speaker. So as usual, this, the, 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 the paper will last uh, roughly half an hour, and then there will be the opportunity to ask questions. So when you ask questions, remember that we are recording this uh, uh, seminar, and we will post it on uh, our YouTube channel. Thank you now, John. OK, uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, thank you for the invitation to, to talk about this project because it is um, um, an unusual project. It's something that's uh, a bit different to the usual kind of things a historian would be involved in doing. Um, so that itself made it um, uh, uh, different and original and um, it fused with uh, fused my own interest in things, which is kind of what I want to talk about a little bit about why it came to be the way that it was. Um, but I should say first off uh, that this the idea of doing it in this way, the initial idea, was not mine. It wasn't an original idea on my part. The person you can blame for this um, is... Oh, get the technology to work. There we go. There we go. Uh, it's this chap, um, Adam Gauntlet, who's a, a literary agent at Peter's Fraser and Dunlop in London. And he approached me about three years ago um, with the, the basic idea of could you make... Uh, a history book relating, he guessed, to war and conflict as much as anything, um, in the same way that they used to be the choose your own adventure style books back in the 1980s. Um, and it was just, he uh, 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 was flying the idea, first of all. And um, he, he approached me. Why he approached me, um, I, I'm not entirely sure. He's never uh, openly admitted. I, I guess there might have been other people who passed on the idea and think it would work. But it, it fused with my own background and interest. Um, and so we started the process of um, trying to put together a proposal. Um, and then it eventually got picked up by Penguin Random House, which is a whole field of publishing and so on, which is completely new and different to me. Um, the, I, I published with Yale before, and that kind of a middle area. But th this kind of publishing was a, a different world and environment. But it interested me because um the, the the basic idea of developing a, a book which should guide you through um, decision making which you could choose your own path through a conflict in um initially we thought more of a, a game environment as well as a um as well as a kind of a textbook as they leading you through in a textual way um through the, the through the the, the storyline um it, it was kind of interesting and different and not something that um uh, as far as we're aware, had been done in that way before. But it, 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 I said that I worked at the idea, I thought the way we could do it was to bring in certain aspects and interests, which um, I thought would be a way of, of approaching something. My own background um, was in using games um, before I be, uh, started teaching university and during teaching university. So it kind of fused the way that I want to approach it. So one of my backgrounds, 
and the way I wanted to approach the, the project was to incorporate the idea of big strategy games. And this shows how old I am, but I played these kind of big strategy hex based games, um, which were all board games, of course, in those days, um, in the early 1980s. And I played things like War in Europe, um, never completed the game. Um, 180 hours playing time, 5,000 counters, 46 square feet of map and so on. Um, and the equally, well, even more prodigiously over the top game, War in the Pacific, uh, which I bought just as SPI went bust. And so I never got my copy back in the, the 1980s. Uh, I now have a copy of it and I still haven't played it. What was interesting to me about these games was, was the strategic element, the big decisions that you made um, in deciding uh, how you wanted to uh, progress your war effort you fought axis and allies forces at uh, various uh, various stages of the war and you chose your big strategic initiatives and then employed your resources to do it it's a fairly um, clunky game system um, almost unplayable it took nine months to a year out of your life to play it um, and I never got past 1943 but the process of how you made the decisions um, was interesting the, the mechanics here were not entirely great but it gave you a flavor and so that this is something I wanted to bring to it. A much better game that I, I've used on occasion in, um, in teaching at master's level, just to give people a flavor of decision making, um, was this, which is uh, Churchill, um, which is the board game, but designed around, it's a three player game, one person representing the Americans, Roosevelt for most of the war, one person representing Churchill, one person playing as Stalin. The idea is that you uh, debate key issues at various conferences through the war and develop a strategy suitable to your own aims in order to win the war. Um, and the, the objective, is, the first priority is to win the war against the Axis powers, both in uh, Europe and in the Asia Pacific region, um, but to maintain a balance of power um, and win the, the, the kind of Cold War environment. So again, the decision making process, the way in which the, the various powers played out at conference and things was a key thing I wanted to bring to it. Um, so I thought that these these were two strands in which a potential game book would would play out because at that kind of level there are big decisions that you can um, debate and there are key decisions which uh, could have gone in different ways which would then explore paths and the way in which the histories worked. I'm also I wanted to bring some kind of counterfactual history to the uh, to the book uh, counterfactual history in historical terms um, is almost like a dark art and most historians uh, blanch the idea of, of engaging in it. But I've always used it, I'm, always, I'm fascinated in it anyway. Um, some of it's better than others and most of it is quite unsatisfying in lots of ways uh, because of the way it, it represents um, transitions in history or decisions in history and fairly major things are rather passed over about how do you get to a certain position. Um, but the idea of exploring that a little bit, and I, I've used it in teaching to look at why decisions are made in the way that they are. So I wanted to bring this element to it. So as well as the big strategic decisions uh, in a gaming sense, what are the consequences of the decisions that are made? And can we explore some of them? Now, these are some literary examples of how that uh, has played out. Some of these are histories, um, some of them are novels, um, and they all explore different elements and are, I find them quite, quite useful, quite interesting at times, if a little frustrating. The problem with the, the history examples of, of what ifs is that they tend to be one single narrative. So one decision or one particular moment is explored and you're taken down uh, a linear path to the outcome. So I wanted to explore um, a little bit more about that, pushing it a little further and exploring it in the context of further decisions. Um, the, uh, the, there are also uh, kind of um, um, uh, portrayals of alternative counterfactual histories and things which are useful into, I find at times engaging students, particularly things like the man in the high castle, uh, an alternative timeline in which the, uh, the, uh, the Germans were in the second world war and got the, the bomb first. Yeah, Interestingly, oh, yeah. never oh, explored yeah. how that's done. Um, but nonetheless, that is kind of interesting. Um, uh, Trish, come here, come here. Can't use Papa's phone. Papa's phone is for meeting. I, I'm, get, I'm getting a, 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 a sound. Sorry about that. Um, That's right. Trying to, trying to mute. <laughs> it's usually from my, from my with children wandering in halfway through. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I wanted to explore some of these themes. 
um, in the um, uh, in how we developed um, the, the, the pathway through the book. But mainly as well, I wanted to bring up the idea of the way I've used games in teaching. Uh, we used to run very many years ago, back in the 90s, a kind of correspondence style game with first year students uh, around, uh, one was around Agincourt, another was around the Battle of Midway, and they formed teams and they had uh, resources, materials, and they had to develop a strategy and prosecute the strategy through a number of moves during the, the first semester at the university. Um, partly as a, a team building exercise, but it, it was also exploring about the use of sources, about how decisions are made, uh, and so on. And we did it with Agincourt and Midway. Uh, more recently, more recently, um, uh, we've used it in a, a gaming sense that's in a third level module where this is a, a, a course around maritime warfare. And so we, we, we used in theoretical elements of it, Mahan and Corbett and various uh, interpretations of developments of maritime history from the late 19th century onwards. Um, and then the students form teams and um, formulate strategies and do they do it's a research exercise as much as anything in which they explore um, the strategic environment, the operational methods that the Germans and the, the British were using at the time of Jutland or in the period of Jutland um, and others, uh, Eastern Solomon's battles in the, uh, 1942 and the Arctic convoys of earlier in 1942. They form teams and they play the game out. So they devise a plan, a strategy, then they try and put it into action. Uh, we have uh, evenings, about four or five hours, where they play out these games. We use miniatures to make it a bit more, a bit more colourful and interactive. Um, and they're in teams. It's a double blind environment. So, the, for example, in this case, the Japanese teams in one room, the American teams in another control room, uh, where the umpires uh, run uh, run the game and they prosecute air strikes against each other and try and achieve their objectives. Interestingly, in this environment, in this particular scenario, the Americans never won. We've done about 10, 12 times. And the Americans can't get a win out of this, which historically is roughly what happened. Um, but it, it produces a way in which the students can engage with uh, the subject. We also use role play. And again, this plays out, it's tying back to the, the, old, the old big strategy games. And this is in a master's course. Uh, MA Second World War, and we get the students at various times to take a particular role in these discussion debate um, situations and through negotiation process. They're supposed to explore the issues, say, confronting uh, the Allies at Casablanca in January 1943. How do we win the war? How deploy our assets and resources in order to be effective? Um, each student uh, takes a, a particular role and they have to explore and research that role and then debate in the situation in the classroom what are the um, issues and what are we trying to achieve and how are we going, going to best achieve it. Now this obviously is an Anglo-American debate as much as anything um, and uh, again it, it explores um, why they took decisions in the way that they did but also is something that could be brought into an environment of a game book about the Second World War, because many of these key strate strategic decisions made at this level um, played out, uh, could have played out in different ways. And so exploring how it was done, why they got to the decision they did, what the alternatives were, was something I wanted to explore. Uh, we, we do similar things around Potsdam and um, other uh, case studies as well. Um, I also have taken students um, uh, to, on field trips and again, the kind of decision alternatives um, are explored. And this is down to tactical level. This is not us on the left hand side, I have to say. Uh, so the nearest we could get to an example of a tutor a tactical exercise without troops. But we take a field, uh, field trip to Normandy and we get them, the students, in teams to devise tactical uh, plans uh, for seizing objectives and so on. Um, some of them are from, with a military background, but most of them are not. Most are coming from history background. Um, and so we look at Operation Goodwood in Normandy in 1944, a big tank battle and how the Germans stopped that assault. Um, and so they're tasked with devising a way of doing that. So, and we do something similar. I do a field trip um, to Arnhem and um, uh, all of the Market Garden area. Again, we look at the choices that the Allies made and why that particular battle uh, unfolded in the way that it did. So again, I wanted to bring some of this element to kind of a tactical level about how those decisions on the ground by troops at the front 
actually play out in deciding the outcome of a battle or an operation or even on, on even a grander level. So some of these elements I wanted to bring in as well in terms of the problem solving aspect um, of the uh, of the book. So a number of themes um, emerged in terms of how the book would be put together and what we would try and do or what I would try and do with it. Um, and I persuaded them that Second World War, because it's something I knew more about than anything else, uh, if I know anything about anything, it's a Second World War. I wanted to focus on a political down to tactical level where possible. So it was mainly around big st strategic decisions about how those choices lead you in different directions and how you could plot your way through these choices. But I also wanted to bring in some of that tactical element about how sometimes on occasions key tactical decisions could actually influence the outcome of a, a, an operation at least and that could then have um, consequences for a wider campaign. I also wanted to explore the decision making process by focusing on key decisions, how they were made, um, the particular pressures at play, the context in which those decisions were made, the available information. One of the things we've always found with, with students is in getting to think about uh, playing out games, for example, or battles, is the lack of information that's open to them. It's always a, an eye in a kind of a world, I guess, where computer games um, tend to give you more information historically you would have in making decisions on the battlefield. Having an experience where you don't have that can be quite unnerving. So it's quite, I wanted to explore that a little bit about what is the amount of information that the people at the time have um, in when they make those decisions? You, we're only touching some of these issues and the, the, these bigger issues, but nonetheless, to give a flavour of that. Um, and then to examine the likely outcomes of those decisions um, within certain parameters. We didn't want, or I didn't want to go um, too far off the historical path because you start to it starts to become very questionable at how far you can push the whole counterfactual idea. But um, at least two stages away from the historical, um, the historical route through the, the, the game or the scenario which is set out in, 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 in the book, in the, the, as we shall see, um, was somewhere I wanted to go to. Just what would have happened if and why, didn't it, why did it end up not being played out in the way that it was? So exploring the consequences of those choices and then the, the, um, how those out outcomes might play out was something I wanted to go with. I also uh, wanted to take it from an eye perspective. There's a lot of uh, what I regard as rather unsavoury literature and fascination with the Third Reich and the Nazis and, and so on um, out there from the perspective of what were they up to, what did they do and decisions, how could they have won the war and so on. I didn't really want to do that. I wanted to look at it from the perspective of the Allies um, maybe that's a weakness, I, I don't know, but that's just where I wanted to come from uh, with the books. So all the choices, the scenarios I play are, are in this current book um, are from the Allied perspective, uh, American, British and, and Soviet. Um, OK, so the structure of how this was going to be put together, how could we put this into, into action, um, was to structure it in terms of uh, a kind of a flow chart of decisions. And I had to do this for each of them in order to make it work. Um, and this roughly then translated into a model, the two effective models of how the scenarios could play out. So it was an initial problem, a choice, a decision that would have to be made, um, and the, the reader will be given context and materials and some examples of documents and, and so on that they could use maps um, as to make the decision. That this is, what, and they would then be offered two alternatives. One would be an outcome which would be in effect the reality is kind of a historical path through the story, not that it was flagged up as such. Um, and the other would be a counterfactual, something different. So you've made a choice and that could then lead uh, in a different direction. Um, the reader would uh, the, the reader would move through the books. Each section would be kind of a standalone small section. There'd be an overall scenario, as we shall see. Uh, and within each scenario, you'd have a, a, an initial choice, which would then lead you to a different part of the book. So if you took in this case the, the outcome here which is the reality it would take you to one part of the book if you took uh, the outcome which is the counterfactual one you would go to a different part of the book so the choice your choice would then shape the way in which you you made your way through the book then you might um in this in this particular module you might have a choice again you would have an outcome which would be a reality and another one which would be a counterfactual and again you'll be exploring the choice well 
if you'd taken a different path, this could have been the outcome and this what might maybe what would have happened. And then finally, there could be another, which would be um, a further outcome or uh, which would be a reality and another outcome which would be a counterfactual. And this proves to be about the limit of where you could get to. Um, for simple mechanics of how you put a book together, um, each chapter, it, the, each structure like this was, was coming in at about 12 to 15,000 words. So with, you could only get so many of these into a book and the, the target that they gave me originally was 80,000 words, which eventually I squeezed it up to you know, 95 to 100,000 words and they, they, they went with it. But there's only so much you could get into um, a, 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 a framework like this. The initial problem needs to be a bit longer, so 3,000 words. The next stage is a couple of thousand words each, and then the final outcomes might be 1,500. You add that all up, it's getting to about 12 to 15,000 words, roughly. Um, so that then put a limit. My original pitch of an idea was there'd be many more potential pathways and outcomes and so on, but it ballooned out of control, and each of the alternatives would have grown into a book in itself and that's not what we were trying to do with this although it could be one path you could take with it um so this was kind of a limited model the other model we went with was slightly different um it was just slightly more counterfactual you have an outcome which was a reality from your first choice another one which would be a counterfactual then your original choice might lead to two um uh, outcomes one would be the real history one the other one would be a counterfactual but you could also go back to your first choice, which is a counterfactual one, and go in two different directions with that as well. So there were two models. This has a bit more counterfactual stuff in it um, and uh, less of the historical path, but I didn't want to push it too far away from the historical path again because it becomes too, too conjectural as to what would, might have happened. Um, so how did I try to put this together? amalgamating these elements. There were eight scenarios we eventually settled upon. Um, these are the ones I went with. Um, I'll look at a couple of examples very briefly in a moment, but basically one was the decision to have Churchill Halifax as Prime Minister in May 1940. Some of you may have seen that film with um, uh, Gary Oldman of a few years ago, The Darkest Hour. Uh, this, this has got more credibility than what I've done in this book than there is in that film in terms of the, why the decision was made, but that's another story. Um, but the other uh, options here, uh, the choice of in war in the Mediterranean 1941, whether to transfer troops to Greece or to carry on with a, a push towards um, Tunisia or through Libya in the spring of 1941, Stalin's war about key, some of it's kind of propagandist in terms of what he was up to. Uh, between 1941 and 1943 in particular about whether to uh, carry on, whether to replace Stalin, whether to carry on with the war at certain times, whether to do a deal in 1943 because the Allies have, have withdrawn from any idea of invading northern France until 1944. There are some tentative things you can play with in terms of exploring uh, what happened. Midway, the Battle of uh, in the Pacific in May, June 1942 is something I wanted to look at. That gives some tactical elements as well down to the front line. Bomber offensive was kind of an interesting one in that um, I wanted to look at um, the different decisions made at different times in the bombing campaign against Germany, and it was this was focused against Germany, um, about the move towards area bombing and targeting civilians and at what point you made it, and why was it made, and what were the consequences, and how that played out through the, the, the entire campaign. So kind of two or three key decisions throughout that campaign. Casablanca, um, the, the starting point being the, the conference in January 1943 and how the consequences of those choices played out into 1944. Um, Arnhem, which is the bridge too far um, um, scenario, the Allies attempt to cross the Rhine in September 1944 with the paratroopers and why uh, it didn't play out in the way that they imagined. And then a, a, a kind of a looser one, which is around the development of the atomic bomb, starting with a uh, famous meeting between Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg in Copenhagen uh, in 1941, um, where Heisenberg may or may not have been fishing for details of the Allies bomb campaign or bomb plans uh, and what the Germans were up to. And then how that plays out, how the Americans then took up the, the path and the choice decisions to make the atomic bomb. Uh, and then the decision about whether to deploy it. Uh, what the consequences of that may or may not have been, which is why that scenario leads on into potentially 1946. 
Um, each of the scenarios had um, uh, an emphasis on present tense that increasingly, as I was writing it, it was necessary to place the reader in the position of making the decision or advising a key play, make a key character in making the decision. So in some cases, uh, you're an advisor to Churchill or Roosevelt and you're providing advice and providing a perspective. So you um, are then provided with documents and um, materials and maps and photographs to make choices, to make an advice, or suppose advising a key uh, figure um, at a, a certain moment. So um, uh, when Nimitz is deciding whether to um, deploy all his forces at midway because he, he becomes convinced that that's where the Japanese are going to attack, what's the evidence for that and is that the right choice and so on. So, so it moved very much to being into a kind of present tense and a participant's perspective uh, on the decision making, which made it more like a game in a way. That wasn't the init initially how I thought it would play out, but it, it made it more a game in terms of you have to make the choice, you're in the position of making the decision, what is the evidence material you're using, how you're going to do that. Um, so how did that play out then in um, uh, a couple of examples? So very quickly, this is um, the war cabinet crisis of May 1940. And the key choice that the reader is presented with, do you choose H Halifax or Churchill as to, to be prime minister uh, as the replacement for Chamberlain? Of course, historically, in the, as, as we're all told by the Conservative Party more than anybody else, Churchill was the obvious choice. Um, the reality, of course, is it, it wasn't. Uh, Halifax was a more natural choice for uh, the Conservative Party, but the wider context prevailed that Churchill becomes Prime Minister. So you're placed in uh, the decision, in the point of advising on that decision. And the character we use, or I, I used to, to develop that, was David Margeson, who was Chief Whip, who was at the meeting where Churchill and Halifax kind of debated with Chamberlain about who was to become, who was to replace Chamberlain's Prime Minister. On, this is on May 9th, 1940. So you're, you, you read that as though you, you, you're Margeson advising or watching what's going on. A decision is then made, you choose which path to go with. Um, one path is that Churchill becomes prime minister and you are then uh, uh, confronted with a second choice. And this time the role you're playing is um, Hastings Ismay, who is uh, Churchill's military advisor or chief military advisor, uh, secretary in, in essence, um, uh, throughout the Second World War. And the decision you have to make here is, is do you, in the, the way, uh, in the likely collapse of France in, in May, June 1940, do you decide to fight on or do you negotiate your way out of the war? And so you are then confronted with a further choice to make. That the fighting on, of course, is the reality. Um, and the, even with the end outcomes, we added, or I added a, a character in order to, to place uh, to, to observe what's going on to give you the feel of being within the moment of the decision in order to play it through in this case is Archie Sinclair um, who was the Secretary of State for Air and the, um, uh, the leader of the Liberal Party such as it was in 1940 um, and so you see from the, his perspective but there's an alternative here which is that you start to open talks with the, uh, the Axis powers and try to get out of the war and that's a counterfactual route the character here is Alexander uh, Cadogan, who was the permanent secretary at the Foreign Office, and he was involved in the decision as to what, what would may have happened. He was an advisor in, in historical reality. In this case, this character is then advising on what do we do here? And they try to negotiate a deal and it goes horribly wrong. Uh, that, that's kind of a consequence of that one. But what if Halifax had become um, prime minister in May 1940? that he would be confronted pretty much at the same time as Churchill was with the decision to negotiate or to fight on. And a key player in this war cabinet uh, environment uh, would have been Clement Attlee, leader of the Labour Party. Um, and he would play a role, he did play a role historically with Churchill, uh, resisting attempts to do a deal, but he could have wavered, you know, there are, there are potential opportunities for a different outcome. So one here is that actually the British do try to get out of the war. And they do a deal with um, Hitler uh, and, and Mussolini in, um, in May, June 1940, and they get out of the war. What were the consequences? What is the outcome of that? And I sort of wrote this kind of stuff. Uh, Sam Hoare would have been, who's a, 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 one of the architects of appeasement back in the 1930s, could well have been the foreign secretary under a Halifax government. Um, and uh, what role would he have played in this? Is what we're trying to explore with that. The other is um, the, the there would have been an attempt 
to do a deal in the Halifax regime? Would it have played out? Would it have worked? Anthony Eden would have been a key player in that. Um, and so we looked at uh, in, that, in that chapter or in that section of the chapter, uh, an, an attempted deal which doesn't really work and they end up um, fudging the government collapses and, and so on. And these are kind of the outcomes. You're kind of exploring what might have happened if. So this was one scenario. An alternative, and just looking at the Midway one again very briefly, is Midway the type big intelligence decision choice in May 1942. Intelligence seemed to be implying that the Japanese were about to attack Midway. Uh, the uh, uh, admiral in charge, Chester Nimitz, had to make a choice uh, and advising him uh, was Lynn McCormick, who was his chief of staff, and they were assessing the intelligence. Is it convincing enough that, yes, the Japanese are definitely going to attack Midway, in which case we put all our resources into defending Midway, and trying to catch the Japanese out without the Japanese knowing? And that's kind of the, the scenario. If they do try to do that, yes, they do deploy forward to, uh, uh, to protect Midway. There's another choice that comes into play. The Japanese position is given away. The American fleet isn't quite in the right place. So they do they risk on sending a big airstrike early, but potentially with greater risk to their own forces? Um, or do they wait until the optimum moment where they can mass their strength and um, do it properly in a coordinated way? Uh, there's a choice there that the commander, in this case, Miles Browning, who was the air group commander with Task Force 16, working under race for the admiral in charge, had to advise on that, uh, that decision. Now, if they don't decide to go for um, uh, uh, a, 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 a forward defence of, uh, of Midway, and they play cautiously, as many intelligence analysts in Washington were advising, what happens? So this is kind of a hedge scenario. You don't go all in. Um, and the consequence in this, and this is quite interesting with this scenario, each time you don't do the aggressive thing or uh, go with the, uh, the, the, the argument, the intelligence assessment will make, you end up with a draw. You kind of play it out, you see what would have happened, strikes and counter-strike. The, uh, the, the character we uh, used here was Elliot Buckmaster, who's the captain of the USS Yorktown, and he, he's uh, observing uh, and advising on what's happening now the Japanese account uh, st struck back against the Americans and the Americans struck them. And it ends up in a scrappy draw, as a lot of the early carrier uh, to carrier uh, battles did in 1942 and 1943. Um, so let's assume the Americans at the top do make an early strike. Um, there's a further choice to be made, which is quite important, which we've come to in the moment. Um, but you could take the cautious one. You could wait for the right moment uh, in order to launch your strike or wait for the cautious moment, mass your forces and deliver a major attack in one concerted blow. Um, and I use the same character of uh, Miles Browning because the historical evidence would imply that he would have gone ballistic if that is what the, the admiral in charge of the, uh, the fleet had done. Um, and that could have caused some real friction. It's quite interesting to see what his perspective of it would be. The reality is that it would probably played out in a scrappy draw again. It seems to be the, the way that this battle would have gone unless key decisions went in the way that they did. Now, the turn north or south is a tactical decision. And this is down to uh, a, 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 a commander a uh, lieutenant commander in a, a dive bomber over the Pacific with his squadron looking for the Japanese fleet. He's arrived at the place where he's supposed to be. It's not there. He has to make a choice. Did the Japanese fleet turn north or have they turned south? And so you're back. So you, again, you're presented with the evidence. Of why, why would you make a decision to go north? Why would you go south? And you have to make the choice. And so that plays out. You turn north, you win the battle and you sink to um, Japanese aircraft carries and another strike sinks a third one and the, the battle turns decisively in American favour and they win the battle. You turn south, you don't, you end up with a draw, uh, you're in the wrong place and potentially uh, uh, an American defeat. So these are the choices. Now it was interesting exploring how despite what you did you ended up with um, uh, you ended up with draws unless you took the right choice at the right moment you ended up in a particular uh, environment in which you couldn't score a, a, a victory. Um, interesting with this scenario, one thing I did what I try at one stage was the Japanese worked out what the Americans were up to and they double trapped the Americans. So they had a, a trap waiting for the American fleet. Um, but it was difficult to factor that in. And I, I just couldn't work it in in the end. It was quite, a, quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting idea. And that would have been calamitous for the Americans. But that is a highly unlikely scenario, and that is one of the elements I wanted to convey.
Okay, let's have a look at some of the strengths of this approach and what we've got out of it. I think um, the book highlighted for me the issues of hindsight. Um, too often, we, we are clearly, just, uh, for those of you who are historians looking back, it's very easy to see what were the right choices and why bad choices were made at times. I think doing it in this way reflects a little bit on you evade that because you're putting the point, the place of making the decision at the moment. And that's that interesting for you to reflect on um, why choices are made and they don't always at the time appear to be foolish ones. Um, I think it fixes uh, our attention on decision making and the context in which you make those decisions. Uh, and so it explores some of the pressures at play uh, at times when um, key characters have to make crucial decisions, the pressures they're under, and it highlights some of the, the difficulties and why decisions are made in um, sometimes an uncoordinated fashion. That, that, that in itself is quite interesting. It does, we use quite a few documents uh, and evidence and maps to illustrate uh, the book in so that you could make choices based on what a, gives a, a facsimile of, of a, a war cabinet minutes or um, a map or an intelligence report or something of that nature. So the reader gets a flavour of the available material and how sources and evidence is used in that decision making process. It certainly examines the roles of participants. And this is one of the interesting things I had to find out about a whole load of people who I knew existed and what the kind of what they did. But who were they? And that was kind of a um, a, a more interesting angle that I hadn't really thought would be necessary, but in, for a book of this nature, in this kind of context, it is, it is quite important. Um, I don't think it drifts too far from the reality, uh, so we don't get um, uh, the, the, the Germans with uh, nuclear bombs in 1943 uh, or 1944 or something of that ilk. It wasn't going to happen, huge amount of evidence, it would never have happened. So I wanted to push some ideas a little bit but not drift too far from reality. So it had some kind of historical underpinning. I think that another strength of doing it this way is it engages a wider readership. It gets them interested in history, military history, the Second World War, um, about how decisions play out. Um, so in terms of a military history readership, it's, get, it's, you know, it's achieved something, but also it's brought in kind of different people who haven't really thought about exploring history in this particular kind of way. So that, that, that was quite useful. Um, I think it also forces re-evaluations uh, of decisions and events. It did for me in a couple of cases, um, I, as I was writing and putting it together, I'm not sure that I now I agree with what I originally thought about this because I've been placed through this, um, through this environment. Okay, um, some weaknesses just to finish off. Um, the format limits the number of steps or decisions you can make. There are only so many decisions you can fit into a chapter uh, before it runs out of control uh, or it becomes so fragmentary that you're not getting much evidence. I mean, some of the later pieces uh, in each chapter were 1,500 words. You can't say a great deal in 1,500 words, so you're just wrapping up a few things. Um, so there's, there's more material with the early ones, but once you add it all up, it limits the number of things you can do. So there's limited space because of the word count. Um, so we could only, um, they would only let me do uh, eight scenarios um, and that's what we were stuck with. But one of the uh, things that's come out is that quite often some of the readers of a, a book like this, they know the historical path. So they know which decisions to make. Uh, not always, quite a, some of them are a bit more uh, obscure, uh, but that, that could be a disadvantage in some ways, but at the very least it allows them to explore the alternatives and what it might have led to. Um, I think at times um, the way I had to do it is that I had to guide the pathway through the book a bit too much and some of it occasionally was a bit artificial I don't know games environments can sometimes do that in that um, if you do this only one other option is likely to come out of it or if you do this I will lead you to this option but you could go to another option and I will lead you to that as well but there are other choices involved in that there are so many choices which would make um, an outcome uh, go a particular kind of way so the, at times I felt I wanted to explore there were a couple of really good options or outcomes to a possible uh, decision uh, one and it could have gone either way really so in one case I explored it in one way but if you make the decision a different way you end up with a, a choice which I've also imposed on you, which is different to the first one but they might have ended up in the same place um, and so there's a, there's a limit to how many pathways you can squeeze um, the project towards uh, without it becoming a little too cumbersome. Um, 
but um, in, in terms of um, where where it's gone or how the project's gone, um, uh, uh, the, the book has done pretty well and they're, they're keen to do another one, um, uh, this time on the First World War. So the idea of how um, th this plays out and how it's engaged people uh, and led them in particular directions and, and piqued their interest um, has been to a degree successful despite some of the limitations that uh, I've mentioned. Okay, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, very interesting uh, paper describing the genesis of uh, uh, the armchair uh, general. Uh, and um, now I open the floor to questions. Uh, if you have questions, you can uh, um, write them uh, uh, in the chat room and I can read them aloud. Or perhaps I can start with um, um, a question myself. Um, how, or regarding the uh, reception uh, of, the, of the book, um, I, I understand that uh, um, it has been well received uh, in terms of sales, but uh, what other um, uh, academics have, uh, have thought about this experiment? Um, so far, re relatively positive. And it, this was something I, I was a bit cautious about because it is, you know, there's kind of an element of um, Bob Dylan switching to an electric guitar in the 1960s. Are you selling out from what you're supposed to do, which is kind of a proper academic history? Um, so, <coughs> uh, but I mean, there's actually the, the response has been from quite a few people. That's a good idea of exploring some of the, the themes and, and, the, and the issues. So, I mean, it, it, in academic terms, it's, it's not a, a book that would go into a ref submission or something like that for an academic, um, uh, you know, an academic purpose. But that, in impact, you know, sort of trying to get people engaged with the subject, I think people have appreciated that quite a lot. So the response from uh, a few people have been, that's a good idea, I wish I'd thought of it. And I have to confess, it wasn't initially my idea. How it's ended up is quite different to the, the original thought that Adam had. Um, but uh, in order to make it work, it was quite a, uh, you know, it was quite a journey. Um, but they, they like the idea, you know, the, 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 the concepts. Uh, the response has been, uh, has been quite good. I think I, it's, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it's not going to, um, it's not going to set the historical world alight in terms of redefining things, but that's not its purpose. The purpose is to explore in a kind of gentle and tentative way, some of the ways in which decisions are made and how you can plot your way through this in a, in a kind of semi-game environment. And, and uh, ref-wise, it probably counts as uh, impact. Uh, yes, no, no, yes. Sorry, impact. <laughs> that, that's, that's how I'm going to play it when it comes to the assessment in a few years' time. Especially uh, if, um, um, uh, if, if Penguin saw it as a kind of pilot experiment and now actually wants to, they want to produce another one, it seems to have, a, it's, it's yeah. clear that there is, a, there is an impact there. Yeah, I mean, there is, the, I mean, the, the, the um, the, the way in which it's told and what they want to do, and it's a different environment, you know, for uh, academic writing completely. Um, and it was a bit of a, an eye opener, you know, that it works in a different kind of way. Um, but interesting in terms of a, a journey. And part of it is that, you know, there's a, an element you can write internally for an academic readership and share ideas. But there is also, I mean, we know there's a greater pressure to. Uh, get what we um, do uh, into a wider context, a wider audience. Th this is a route to doing that, We're writing for a, a, a wider readership. It's easier with military history, war history, sadly than for other areas, but nonetheless, um, there is something to be said for trying to do it in a kind of an original engaging way, which is hopefully what this has achieved. Perfect. Um, I see the, there is a question in the chat. Uh, decisions are often heavily influenced by doctrine by staff, staff officers, technical advice, and so on. Readers may have uh, only limited knowledge of these. Did you address this issue? Uh, a little bit in a few places. I and mean, uh, there was, um, in two of the scenarios in particular, um, for example, the, um, the Midway one, the, uh, the, there was a, in order to explain why that you hesitated about launching with your strike, yeah, um, um, uh, uh, on the morning of the 4th of June 1942, do you go early or do you play cautiously and wait to mass your force? You had to explain what the doctrine was. How was this supposed to work? How was it supposed to play out? How are you supposed to use your assets in an ideal world? Um, 
and there was a it had to be a compromise to kind of compress that into something which would be palatable uh, to be but was enough to explain why you had to wait potentially or you went early were, were, was quite was quite tricky so you're right that um and there, there was always a trade-off that um some of the readers would know a great deal more than others and you can't it, it, it's a different kind of a, a, a environment really uh, than the academic writing where you you hope you expect that the, the people reading it know sufficiently in order to be want to read what you're doing in the first place with this couldn't do that so explaining that issue and getting it in the other one was um in the the arnhem um, chapter I'm trying to explain about um uh, airborne warfare doctrine and how the allies had previously used their forces how they were then going to have to deploy them in, in for operation market guard in september 44 um was quite difficult you know in terms of and in a way having to explain it is slightly different to a game format where you're given the pieces and supposedly you are driven to a, a choice by the mechanics of the game you know certain choices are open to you in this case I had to le legitimize why they were getting these two options and explaining why so it added a different element to it um so in a couple of the scenarios i had to explain a little bit more um most of them most of them were mainly around political strategic decision making uh and and there you had to explain a different kind of context not only doctrine but the pressures at play at a, a strategic political level from particularly for those who are interested in the military aspects of it, why do you not do the obvious military thing? Because there's a political strategic context driving you in a different direction. Actually, it makes more sense if you see the bigger picture. So there's a kind of pressure, as you say, the pressure at the doctrine level, but there's also pressure at the top in terms of uh, explaining to me the bigger picture, what's going on here. It's not just about tanks and airplanes. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Any, if you have any other question, please, um type it in the uh, chat. Um, in the meanwhile, um, I have another question myself um, for Paul, which is, uh, 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 did writing these um, game book um, help you uh, with your own research? Did, you, did it give you different ideas? Um, um, did, 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 did it have a, an impact on your academic uh, research? It did, it did actually. I mean, I can, any piece of work which you do, uh, usually you hope reflect makes you reflect upon what it is you're you're dealing with but there are a couple of examples um in a broader sense which shape the way you you, you interpret the, the second world war and some of the big decisions have been made and one of them was um uh, i had always been kind of an advocate of uh, lord allenbrook and his vision of the the mediterranean strategy in the second world war and pursuing that further into 1943 he seemed to kind of make a a sense from the the, the, the British perspective um, in terms of interpreting how the war played out. The more I did some work on this, it looked more about the decision making and the strategic in, uh, drivers behind why Marshall was arguing for a, a, an invasion of uh, or a greater concentration of Northwest Europe rather than the Mediterranean. The more it seemed actually to make sense. Really, there's, a, the, there's more to um, his argument, Marshall's argument about a, a greater pressure in Northwest Europe, whether or not that would have resulted in a successful invasion of um, Northern France in 1943, one of the things in one of the scenarios I, I look at, is another question, is another matter, probably not. But the strategic driver was interesting that it made me reflect upon that. And um, on the Arnhem one, um, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised writing a, a, a book about market garden at the moment have been for a very long time I've been distracted by the project such as this one uh, so i've got to go back to that so doing that chapter on arnhem market garden uh, um made me reflect more upon the key moments at which if you follow the path through the decisions are made and the alternatives that were open to that moment and i've always been fascinated by the decision making process of Montgomery and in the 21st Army Group in Northwest Europe in 44, 45, how that functioned, because he's seen in a particular kind of way. I wanted to explore more about what was going on inside his mind in terms of how he made his decisions. Um, and this, doing this project, made me look at some of the other points at which he interacted with that process and why it led to the launch of Operation Market Garden when pretty much everybody else, 
in senior positions in, in, in command in Northwest Europe in 44, for, in 1944, thought it was probably going to be a bad idea, yet it still goes through. And that kind of fascinates me. So playing through how that process for this project um, uh, threw a few, uh, a few points of interest onto that. Perfect. Yes, I had a similar experience um, writing. Uh, we, we, I wrote a couple of um, expansions for a for war game. So, mm. yes, it, I think it's um, um, writing this kind of um, interactive um, works um, uh, forces, you, for, forces you, you know, a little bit to go beyond uh, uh, basically to ask new questions, uh, yes. to explore new things that probably you, you wouldn't thought about uh, if you're not. Mm. Uh, Done this kind of interactive exercise. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. It's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, um, also, I, I have another question myself. Um, you mentioned that you uh, decided to cover uh, the point of view of uh, the allies, not of the Axis. Mm. Um, what? Uh, so, uh, is it because being a game, uh, uh, it's more difficult to interact with the, in, in a gaming environment, perhaps uh, uh, with with the uh, we, we, in this case, with the axis, then the allies. Um. Um, no, I mean, I, it was a bit. It was a little bit of that, um, and the, I mean the, the, the dysfunctionality of uh, decision making in uh, the axis powers, particularly the European. Well, no, all the axis powers in the in the Second World War. Um, I mean that is fascinating in terms of such how those decisions are made and uh, and so on. Um, but I, it's more kind of thing that there's, there's, there's a literature which um, and a, an interest in um, how the Nazis functioned, what the Third Reich was about. Um, and there's a lot about if only Hitler had done this, if only Hitler had done that. And I don't know. I've just got an unsa a feeling that it's a bit unsavoury. Um, so it's not really um, uh, so objective, really, in terms of why this. I just didn't want to, when I used to play board games or, or war games or, or similar i never wanted to be the the the, the germans russians um you, you know italians japanese uh brits whatever no problem germans i don't know and there's just there's too much fascination with the ss and the third right and anything where you, you do something where you're making decisions which have a more positive outcome for the third right i don't know i just i just couldn't do it so um but we're having a similar discussion uh, I'm, about the first world war possible book which that they want to do um, they are going to kind of co-write it with a colleague uh, and that was um do we do it just from the um the allies perspective or do it from the central powers imperial germany and so on is not the same beast as the third reich um so is that something we could consider but i think we might do the same look at how you defeat so the, the kind of the, the strap i would can you stop the Kaiser or something like that as, to, as your starting point and then look at the various methods and it brings you in lots of different powers and, and decisions into that, which would be interesting. Um, so, no, it, it was just a, a gut instinct, really, not to want to do it from the Nazi perspective. And uh, you just covered another question that I had, whether it, ah. you're writing another one, which is yes, uh, yeah. you're co-writing the next one of the First World War. There is another question, uh, Alan. I see that you raised your hand. Hi. Yes. Um, sorry, I seem to be asking questions. Um, I, I totally agree with your view on not doing the axis. I, I think partly, partly, I think the reason why the gut, your gut reaction is correct is because I think that the readers will be will find it much easier to get into the shoes of, well, certainly of the British and Americans. Getting into yeah. the shoes of the of the Nazis would be really difficult, and I don't mm. think possibly not as useful so i think that's definitely uh, a, a, a good decision i think so um, thank you mm. um i'm i'm not particularly interested in, in in this kind of thing because i i write kind of war game stuff mm -hmm. um as part of part of my my game design um things that i do and i find when i'm writing war game I mean, it's probably similar to Gianluca that when i'm writing war game scenarios the it's how how you how you bound players into something which might be realistic and not mm -hmm. completely off piste is very difficult and i suspect that the the book format gives you the ability to 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 set parameters quite nicely for 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 i was going to say players for readers players mm -hmm. um so they don't mm -hmm. go too far off piste which is which mm -hmm. is uh, which is quite useful 
Yeah, so it, it can. Um, in one, I mean, I, I, when using games in teaching, when trying to get the students to think about particular choices they make as to why they do it, and there's always some member of a group that comes up with a wacky left field yeah. idea yeah. about how to reinvent. We're going to, I don't know, beat twenty dreadnoughts on Kent or something like that in order to change them. whatever it may be, and um, shaping them away from that. It, I mean, in, in one sense, in uh, I use these kind of things in teaching, you give them documentary materials, you give them things they're supposed to, they're not always, but they're supposed to go and read in order to, say, to, to make it patently clear why that wouldn't have happened. Um, um, and so the, it should narrow down the, uh, the parameters and choices open to them into those which are feasible and any kind of research or thought will make them stop them from doing that. But if that, I can imagine that's quite difficult if you're doing, you know, you're doing serious uh, game stuff as to how to prevent people that because you need to give them the latitude to make those choices to make those decisions. Um, and you hope that the game mechanics will prevent them from getting away with it or doing something so spectacularly bonkers that it, yeah. it changes something. Um, the book, the book once goes the other way, you see, and that was one of the problems that your the options are quite narrow. And uh, uh, I say in a couple of occasions, one choice could have led to two options um and both of those options could have ended up in the same result but i i changed it and i deliberately structured it in such a way that if you do it this way you get this result but if you do it this way you get a different outcome even though you might have had the opposite outcome if you see what i mean yes. and just to explore what the possible uh, consequences might have been so it's deliberate only in two three cases has that become an issue um but I just wanted to explore the different options. So it's a bit unfair in a couple of cases where the reader could have taken decision A and they could have got X or Y as their, as their outcome from it. Um, and they took decision B, they could have also had X and Y. So they, it's a bit unfair to force them into one of those outcomes in a way. Um, but it does prevent it, it. And that was the other thing. I didn't want it to go too far away from um, what was historically credible. Yeah. Um, and, and I just... I suspect that with with war game design, it, it's, we 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 tend to give players a fairly open ended situation and let them make decisions. Mm. I suspect that at, at, that coming closer to your narrowing of the decision space might be a better idea. But if they, if they haven't got the the technical or, or, or doctrinal background, if you like, mm. Mm. then maybe just constraining them by by saying, "Well, you have you have these three options," rather yeah. than letting them take whatever <laughs> whatever action yeah. they want, might be a better way of. Yeah, and I mean, some of the um, some board games and things do that quite effectively yeah. in terms of your, your choices are narrowed down to what is realistic uh, at a particular moment. Um, but you can also within games, um, you can get corralled into following a particular path that really is, is quite uncomfortable. I, I, I mentioned at the start about the, the SPI game, War in Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, the big the thing which is unsatisfying about the game in, in lots of ways is that it's um the, the strategic political angles are, are fairly abstract and modern games you know you get cards and you get more of a political element um uh, to it which makes it kind of interesting you, know, you get more context and things but the problem with the spi war in europe game you spend 180 hours potentially anyway, 180 hours playing it but american entry into the war is fixed in december yes, 1941 yes yes, uh, yes. So, well, you know you know what's going to happen exactly so it's it, it's a real game problem in that one um and other issues about how they they, they force the soviet players to do certain things at certain times uh, that if they in any way aggressive or step outside of what historically happened it brings all down calamitous outcomes when the germans invade and yes. uh, you well, know I was, it, try, I was trying to do, to devise a simple very 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 simple world war ii strategic game on just based mm. on a few cards mm. but the problem is the moment you give somebody a counterfactual as as you know from the books here it opens up multiple threads and and by the time you've gone to about three levels in you mm. found you you don't know what you don't know what can happen mm. um so it's very difficult to constrain the strategic mm. context mm. um to, to make it at all realistic mm. and there's a i mean there's an element of that as well when people read historical fiction um and 
I mean, I like you know, a bit of historical fiction every now and then, um, but usually out of the area, which I know a great deal about because um, I find it difficult to how things are explained in that context because they're leading you in a different path. And you know that it's not right. You know, it's, it's very difficult to break that. Um, and so it's getting too far away from what you understand to be the, inter the prevailing interpretation that a truth is about. I mean, you know what I mean? Um, and so in a, 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 a game situation, the further you get away from the past, or in the, the book situation, the further you got away from it, you, there are so many variables, so many intangibles that somebody could throw at you. You could say quite legitimately, yeah, you're right, that could have happened and that would have totally unhinged the path that I've explored. Um, so the, 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 there's an element as ever with these things, it has to be a balance between, is it an exploration of historical evidence and potential outcomes, um, or is it a game? And it, it's got to be somewhere between the two, hasn't it? I, I, was, I suspect. Yes. That's I, I, take. My, my, my takeaway from it is that in, in some of my war game design, constraining, constraining the decision space, making the players stick mm. to things which in my view, at least, as the designer, mm. <laughs> in my view, are at least believable, yeah. uh, mm. even if they, even if they might be slightly, um, mm. uh, they may be completely counterfactual, but I think they, they mm. could, they could at least constrain players to some element of reality. Mm. I think it's a good idea. Mm. Well, thank you. That's great. Sure. No, it's good. For interesting. Thank you. Perfect. And we have another question: Is the book going to be published in the US? Ah, that in itself is quite interesting. I, I think you can guess it in the US, but. Uh, the publishers, when we were exploring, discussing the second book, it struck me that an obvious one, not that I'd be able to do it because I, I don't know about it, um, would be one in the American Civil War. Um, because, I mean, that was kind of a, a, you know, an interesting, hot, counterfactual thing, lots of different options and things. Um, but the Penguin or Random House, I'm not which who, who, who what's the main part of it, they're a bit nervous about going into the American market because they think the Americans are quite protective about their Civil War history and that a British publisher um, and a, a non-resident American writing about the subject would not go down too well. It, it's kind of, you know, a hot political area uh, more than perhaps other subjects uh, for a whole variety of reasons. Um, so um, whether or not they're going to move more into, into the American market, because it would, I think it would still be a really good idea for somebody to do something like that. I mean, there's so much stuff in there um th there is more of a political dimension to it i know but uh, that in itself makes it more of a challenge and interesting um i, I think in the case of this book um I, I think you can get it in the states um that's my understanding and they wanted it to be not just from the british perspective so it isn't you know half of the book is uh, uh from uh, uh, the american ally perspective the interaction with the british so a couple of the early ones are specifically British, but most of the others are not. Casablanca and the Italian um, campaigns and all that kind of stuff, and the bomb and the, those kind of things are multinational, really, because they wanted to, you know, just to, to work with an American market as well. So I think it's available in the States. I see that. Um, I see the, the Kindle and Nook editions, but hard copy seems to be shipped from the UK right now. So. I'll have a word of the publisher. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, if there is no other question, um, in that case, I'll, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, our speaker tonight for uh, uh, the very interesting uh, um, uh, paper. And uh, we will uh, uh, publish the recording uh, on uh, our YouTube channel. But I also take advantage of this uh, opportunity to advertise our next seminar, uh, which will be on the 28th of April. Uh, Professor Catherine Lewis will talk about crusading and masculinity in Dante's Inferno, uh, the, uh, the computer game. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you again very much for joining us uh, uh, tonight. And uh, I look forward to see you at the next seminar.